Hello and welcome to Tech Deals CPU Performance Comparison. Today we are testing three different processors. The AMD FX8300, AMD's brand new Ryzen 7, and Intel's i7-7700K KB Lake processor. Each of the processors is running at a different frequency. The reason for this is they're running at the best frequency that I could get them to run at at a reasonable temperature and voltage. 4.5 GHz for the FX8300, 4.0 GHz for the Ryzen 7 uh, 1800X, and then 4.7 base clock speed with a turbo boost to 5.0 on the i7-7700K. The system memory is also different speeds. DDR3-1600, DDR4-2400, and DDR4-3200 respectively. Please note, Ryzen does support more than, 30, than 2400 DDR4. However, I had to use this because the pre-production motherboard that I'm testing on has an early BIOS that does not support anything higher than this. That will be fixed here shortly, so you will get better performance once I can get an updated BIOS into the board. We are testing three different games today. Battlefield 1 Campaign Mode, Assassin's Creed Syndicate, and Mankind Divided. Please note, in an upcoming video, I will test Battlefield 1 Multiplayer. I did Campaign Mode here because it was relatively quick and I could get it done fast. The multiplayer battles take longer to do to get a good map and a good run with a good benchmark. So, Multiplayer Battlefield 1 will be coming up soon. Assassin's Creed Syndicate is normal play in the game as you would expect. Mankind Divided is going to be short. It's the built-in benchmark. I might come back to it if there's interest in actually doing gameplay in that one. If you are interested in seeing gameplay in that, let me know in the comment section below. If you'd rather see a different game tested, leave that in the comment section below. I have filmed about a dozen games on these three processors so far. I am probably going to do more. But if there's something specific you want to see, yeah, gotta let me know below so I can see if maybe I can include it for you in a future video. All three games are played at 1440p resolution on the EVGA GTX 1080 for the win 2, Battlefield 1 at Ultra DirectX 11, Assassin's Creed Syndicate very high at DirectX 11, and Mankind Divided very high at DirectX 12. Now one of the questions somebody's bound to ask is, why run at such high detail settings at 1440p resolution? Aren't we testing CPUs here? Yes we are, but we're also testing how you might actually run them in a real computer. I am fully aware that some people are going to say, well you should run them at low detail at 1080p to really see the differences between the CPUs. Sure, but no one buys $300 to $400 CPUs to do that. Or at least, they shouldn't, and if they are, they're doing it wrong. This is real-world testing. This is how you'll really use the computer. This is how you'll really play games. So I've put a very nice graphics card, which soon will be a $500 graphics card, maybe $550 since it's a for the win, along with these CPUs and running it at 1440p, which is what this level of computer should really be run at. I used NVIDIA Shadowplay to record the gameplay that you're watching. I also used Fraps to record the frame rate on Battlefield 1 and Assassin's Creed Syndicate. The built-in benchmark was used for Mankind Divided. Shadowplay takes away about 5% of the frame rate, so add 5% to the numbers if you care and you want to know what it's going to perform like without Shadowplay running. Now I'm going to cut ahead here and show you a place where the frame rate really drops. Take a look at the real-time frame rate on MSI Afterburner in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. We're currently running at 90 frames per second, which is wonderful. Now we're running at 30 frames per second. The thing with the FX8300, which is the gameplay you're currently watching, is the frame rate is all over the place. Sometimes it's great and it's absolutely wonderful. The fact that this $99 processor plays Battlefield 1 as well as it does is awesome, until it doesn't. It is very inconsistent in performance. And look, we're back to 80 frames a second. Now it goes up and down and up and down at various points. I simply cut to this to show you how it's great until it isn't. You will see that very different on the other two CPUs. In fact, I'll trim those and show you that same spot so you can see the difference in frame rate. Now at the end of this video, I'm going to show you the actual graphs with the minimum, maximum, and average game performance on each of these games and each of these CPUs. 
But the short version is, the reason to upgrade from an FX8300 to a Ryzen is not so much the average frame rate, which is really, really good on the FX chip. It's the minimum frame rate and the smoothness. It is dramatically different. I've now tested 12 different games on these CPUs. It is the minimum frame rate, smoothness, and game responsiveness that you're buying with Ryzen, more so than raw high-end frame rates. We are now gonna cut to the Ryzen CPU. If you look in the upper right-hand corner, I've got a title card so you know what we're playing. But if you look at the MSI afterburner numbers, you will see our RAM usage, our CPU usage, our VRAM usage, which of course is gonna be the same between machines because they all have a GTX 1080 in them. Our frame rate is better on Ryzen, but it should be, it's a brand new high-end CPU. A note worth making here. Now, I actually did run all of these on the R7 1800X. The 1700, which is actually what I think most people should buy, has a turbo speed of 3.7, but it doesn't run at 3.7 when you're using four or eight cores. But you can overclock it, and I would recommend that you do so. How much? Well, I think most of them should run at 3.7 fix, just fine on reasonable cooling. I have not tested the Wraith Spire LED cooler that comes with it yet because I don't have one. AMD unfortunately didn't send me one. I've asked for one. We'll see if I can get one or not. This is running on liquid cooling. However, 4.0, which is the top turbo speed of the 1800X, is the best I could get. Even with a uh, 240 millimeter liquid cooler, the system would simply not finish booting Windows at 4.2. It would boot Windows, but not run games at 4.1. For anybody who's worried that AMD sent out golden samples that were perfect and overclocked beautifully, well, no, they didn't. Um, they did test them to make sure they worked, but uh, no, it, it didn't run over four gigahertz. Um, no matter how much voltage I, well, I gave it, uh, 1.45 volts, which is absolutely the most you want to give it, and even that is questionable. I ended up backing it off to 1.4, which is what all of these tests were run at. I'm now going to trim the video to the same campaign scene that brought the FX8300 to a screeching halt. Smoke, fire, blasting. We drop down into the mid-30s on the FX8300. Ryzen is doing just fine in the mid 80s. It is a tremendous difference. It is a completely new CPU. It is a new generation. It really is that much better. And that is the biggest difference because pr prior to Ryzen, all you could compare AMD with to Intel was the FX8300. And the FX8300 is a good budget CPU, but it does not hold a candle to modern i5 and i7 CPUs from Intel. Ryzen does. It's Ryzen to the occasion. Okay, sorry. I won't do any more Ryzen jokes, I apologize. But it, it really is good, and I'm very, very happy with it. I've been an Intel user for many, many years, but I do remember the glory days of AMD back on the Athlon, Athlon XP days, uh, back when Thunderbird and Thoroughbred were the thing, back in the wonderful Pentium 4 days. So I'm glad that AMD is back. If you are looking for competition to Intel, Ryzen is it. Look at all this fire and destruction. And we're still in the 70s. 1440p, ultra detail. Ryzen's doing a great job. How about KB Lake? How about the i7 7700K, 4.7 up to 5 gigahertz turbo with DDR4 3200. We have a huge 800 megahertz RAM advantage here as well. RAM speed is starting to make a difference in certain games. Not all, but it does make a difference. I cannot run over DDR4 2400 at the moment because of the MSI motherboard I was sent. We're waiting BIOS updates that releases the timing restrictions. That will get fixed. I will get DDR4 3200 or 3000 into Ryzen and get some updated benchmarks. But consider that you're looking at the worst case scenario for AMD. And realistically, the best case scenario for Intel. KB Lake is six years of refinements from Sandy Bridge. From the Z67 motherboard through the 77, 87, 97, all the way through the seventh generation chips in the Z270, the chipsets, the motherboards, the BIOSes are just refinements of what we've had for years. It's the pinnacle of the Sandy Bridge architecture refined and upgraded and improved over the years. Ryzen is brand new. 
new production process for AMD, new motherboard design, first time with USB 3 or 3.1, native USB 3.1 support, first time with PCI Express 3, first time with DDR4. It is a huge jump forward. So we've got a new platform, new production process, new motherboard. There are gonna be teething issues. You've got to expect if you're gonna be an early adopter the first three to six months, there's gonna be a lot of BIOS updates. But Intel goes through this as well. I, some of you may not remember this, but when X99 came out, if you weren't on X99, my X99 board, my ASUS X99-A board, had like nine BIOS revisions in the first six months or something like that, maybe it was seven months. So they had issues there. Uh, 10 years ago, when the Neelham chips and the first i7s came out, there were a bunch of BIOS revisions then as well. Anytime they come out with an all new platform, you're going to have that happen. So expect it. If you get with Ryzen, you're going to have BIOS updates. There's going to be a, a curve as they clean up all the little things. I would like to say Ryzen was completely stable. Knock on wood didn't crash once absolutely totally 100 percent stable in all of my testing not one now once i found a clock speed and a voltage that worked not one blue screen not one lockup rock solid perfect now here i am still talking about ryzen when we're playing on an intel chip but that's really the point of this video we're comparing the new ryzen against good old standby i7 from intel now look at our frame rates look at our cpu usage look at our ram usage i mean the i7 plays this game perfectly. The whole point of this comparison is, can you substitute the i7 7700K, which is in fact in 2017 the fastest gaming desktop processor in the world, with a Ryzen 7 CPU, with a almost one gigahertz clock speed deficit, and still play AAA titles in great detail at great performance. Yes, you clearly can. I mean, what do you even need to see the graphs at the end of this video to know it's going to be fine? Spoiler alert, the i7's faster. But so what? Between 80 to 100 frames per second, does it really matter? Now, if you're on a high refresh rate monitor, let me say this. If you play on a 100 to 144 hertz monitor, yes, the i7's probably the better choice if gaming is your primary interest because it does produce higher average frame rates and for high refresh rate gaming that's important do you play on a 60 hertz monitor it makes no difference you're not going to see it because your monitor can't display it ryzen 7 is in my opinion the better deal if you're playing at 60 frames per second turn vsync on and both of these cpus will run rock solid steady at 60 frames a second without any issues whatsoever now I'm gonna trim this here and take you to this same spot in the video just so you can compare the difficult section of this mission, the smoke, the fog, the fire. We're at about 80, actually we're a little less at the moment, we're 75 frames per second. Of course the actual combat is slightly different each time. The benefit to doing the campaign mode though, same area, same enemies, it's much more repeatable than multiplayer is. I will do a follow-up to this on these CPUs in multiplayer. Well, maybe not the FX because it's dreadful in multiplayer, but at least these two CPUs to show you the difference. All right, that's enough Battlefield 1. How about we go take a look at Assassin's Creed Syndicate? Now, this is a fairly early mission. I've actually advanced beyond this in the game at this point. However, this is in-engine. Take a look at the frame rate. I find that the in-engine cinematics are actually in many regards more difficult than the actual gameplay, the close-ups, the details, etc. Look at our frame rate. We're at about 44, 45 frames per second. This is not holding at 60 frames per second on the FX8300. Look at our CPU usage. This CPU is being pounded. It is using all of those cores. Unfortunately, they're pretty weak cores, which is why we're having some trouble. Now, notice the frame rate immediately improved as soon as we got into the world. I'm running around, I'm chasing the thief at the moment. We're holding it roughly 60, not quite 60 frames per second. That's cool, climbing the walls. I have to say, these type of games are usually not my personal preference, but the fact that you can run all over the game environment up and down is kind of cool. There we go. Yep, yeah, I'm still figuring it out. Is this playable on the FX8300? Amazingly enough, it is. And I'm going to show a variety of different games. Not every game test I show you 
is going to say, yes, go buy the newest, most expensive CPU. It's the best in the world. Some of these game tests I'm going to show you say it doesn't really matter what CPU you buy. It matters what GPU you buy. Take a look at the graphics card. We are using 98% of our graphics card, basically all of it. This game is mostly GPU bound. We're running at very high detail preset at 1440p. Now there is a detail set above this, ultra very high. Performance is dreadful. Ultra very high in this game is for screenshots. It is not, yeah, forgive my bad gameplay here. I was trying to figure out what to do. This was actually, I think, my first play through this mission. Well, I did it once or twice to figure it out, and then I went and recorded it, but uh, whatever. You don't care about that detail. What you care about is how well the game plays. Having played through the rest of this mission where you eventually run up to the top, and then you meet your sister, and then you run down, and you get in the carriage, it stays pretty consistent like this. It does not hold a solid, rock-steady minimum 60 frames per second, but it is, in fact, very, very playable. I did play through different areas on each of the CPUs. Performance was remarkably similar. All right, this gameplay we're looking at here is in sequence three. It's after we completed that first sequence and we escaped, and now we've got the map open with London. This is even more challenging because watch what we're doing here. We're running between the carriages. We're, I'm gonna go tackle that. They're fun event environments that are going on. Oh, did he just push that kid down? Okay, we've gotta stop him. Hey, look at these two guys here. They won't mind. Uh-oh. They're going to spot me. Okay, who cares about the game? Well, okay, if you like the game, you like the game. But take a look at our frame rate. Look familiar. Yeah, that's awfully similar to what... Now, I'm looking at the ground, so it's not having to run to the world, so it just jumped up to 80 frames per second. This is one of the challenges to benchmarking an open game like this where you control the camera. You can make the results almost anything you want if you want to. I played about 20 minutes. I ran around, I did a side mission here. You can see the map there. I went and grabbed some chests and a few other things. As a game reviewer, by looking at the ground or looking at the sky or standing in certain areas, you can influence the outcome if you want to. One thing I tried really hard to do was not to do that. What's the point of testing it if you're just trying to look for a specific result? That's the other reason why I ran around and did enough different things was to try to average out the differences. If you run for 20 minutes rather than five minutes, what you're gonna end up with is a situation where, that's pretty cool, just <laughs> kick, kick that chest open. You're gonna end up with highs, lows, and then the average is gonna be somewhere in the middle. Minimum frame rates, when you look at the graphs at the end of this video in Assassin's Creed Syndicate are where they're at, because in 20 minutes of running around, it only has to hit those minimums once, and there are a couple of places where it tags it once. Now, it has been suggested to me, why in the world don't you do 99% minimums instead of pure minimums? I should, and I probably will going forward. It's more work to record them because you got to get the whole spreadsheet then cut out the box. It's not that much more work, but I didn't do it this time. I probably should have. I am aware of that. For those of you who don't know what 99% is, um, essentially the 99th percentile takes the theory that you're gonna have one frame in a 20 minute run that's down at 20 frame, that it's at 20 FPS and is not representative of the run. So a 99th percentile run removes the bottom 1% of the frames. The idea being is over a 20 minute run, 1% is next to nothing. Quick interruption here, I'm gonna switch over to the Ryzen CPU so this video isn't an hour long. It's gonna be half an hour long, but here we go on Ryzen. That's gorgeous, isn't it? The detail on the characters. Yeah, I threw it back here because it's just, I like, it's beautiful. I would absolutely watch a movie made in Game Engine. Well, we're really going there, aren't we? I mean, one of these days, Hollywood's not gonna bother filming movies. <laughs> Everything's just gonna be on the computer. But you can do so many things with imagination when you don't have to bother building sets, although I guess we need actors and voices behind it, but regardless. Okay, back to the game. Look at our frame rate. The frame rate here is a little bit kind of sort of higher than the others. We're in the mid-60s. Are we going to dip below 60? We'll, we will a couple of times. The minimums are not going to hold the 60, but it's not bad. This game is heavily graphics bound. An i5... 6500 or 7500 
at the FX8300 frankly runs this game fine. And it's a good representation that you don't always have to have a brand new high-end $300 plus dollar CPU to play a game such as Assassin's Creed Syndicate. What you need is a five to six hundred dollar graphics card. Now that's to play at very high detail at 1440p. At 1080p at high detail, a two hundred dollar graphics card would play this game absolutely perfectly. So you don't have to spend that much money. But if you want to play at these settings in this detail, then yes, well, you kind of do. There we go. Pardon me while I take your money, dear dead sir. In any case, this shows you what Assassin's Creed Syndicate does on these three. Let's go take a look at Mankind Divided. Here we are on the FX8300 in Mankind Divided. Now this is DirectX 12 and it's not being tested with Fraps, which doesn't support DirectX 12. Instead, the game's built-in benchmark is being used. So the numbers you will see at the end of this video are derived directly from the game numbers. When you look at the numbers in this game, you may wonder why in the world would I run the test at these settings? One very simple reason I touched on it earlier, which is your graphics card makes more difference to game performance than your CPU does in most games. This is another one of those examples. Many people are saying in various forums and comments around the internet right now that AMD's Ryzen CPU is not as good of a gaming CPU as the i7-7700K. Now, objectively that's true. With VSync turned off and the details turned down, undeniably the i7-7700K is a faster chip, especially in certain older titles such as Grand Theft Auto V, which are noticeably faster, on KB Lake. However, if you have a 60 Hertz monitor and you turn VSync on, it really makes no difference. Ryzen is 10 to 20% slower on, in most cases when gaming than the 7700K, but it's miles faster and everything else. And considering that it's less expensive, that makes it an incredible value for the money. However, speaking of value for the money, I still am actually very impressed with this FX8300. Now, the purpose of this video is not to preview the FX8300 per se, although I'll link it to my build video on that. I recently built that FX8300, and I did so to test against Ryzen more than anything else. It has impressed me with how playable it is across many different games. If you are on a budget, if you have no interest in a three to four hundred dollar processor, for ninety nine dollars plus sixty dollars for a motherboard, that entire build, the whole computer with power supply, case, storage, RAM, and everything, is six hundred dollars. That's not bad, and it does in fact play modern games with a reasonably good graphics card installed. Now, it's not going to play them at ultra detail with any, you know, with something like this, but it, it will play them medium to high detail at 1080p just fine. Now that we're on the Ryzen chip, how are we doing? Frame rates are higher, but not much. We're entirely graphics card limited here. I have got a GTX 1080 in here, and it isn't making much of a difference. Certainly, you could lower the resolution in detail, but as I said before, who's going to go out and spend $1,000 on just your CPU and graphics card, forgetting the rest of your... You're building a $1,500 to $2,000 computer to do what? Play 1080p at medium detail? No. So, what use is that? In games like Mankind Divided, it doesn't actually matter what CPU you buy. Not really. Certainly, the more CPU you have, the better it's going to be in busier areas. This is a built-in game benchmark. It's not actually the game, which does sometimes make a difference. One final point I will reiterate that I said at the beginning of this video. I am running my 1800X at 4 gigahertz. The R7-1700, which actually I recommend for gaming more than the 1800X, $330, including a very nice cooler. Now... You can absolutely set that to 3.7 gigahertz locked on all the cores, and it's likely to do just fine. However, if you give it more cooling, then it should run just fine at 4 gigahertz, just like the 1800X. I don't really see a lot of need to actually spend the extra money for the 1800X, which I'm sure AMD doesn't want to hear, but that's the reality of it. But even if you have to run at 3.7, you're only giving up about 7% of your performance. It's not a large deficit. 
In most games, it is not going to make a noticeable difference. It is worth noting that the 7700K also has a $100 liquid cooler on it, which is why it's running at 4.7 base 5.0 turbo, and it's got nice high-speed RAM. Remember, there is a RAM difference here, which will go away as soon as the BIOSes get updated, and we can put DDR4 3200. Uh, yeah, 7700K is faster, but for my money, in 2017, if I'm buying a machine for the next three to five years, I would absolutely buy R7-1700. It is good enough for games, and it is awesome at everything else. There is nothing that I've tested so far where I've said, oh gee, if I only had another 15% performance, everything would be fine. There really isn't. So, let's take a look at the results, shall we? Battlefield 1 on the FX8300 averaged 90 frames per second. That surprised me. When I first ran this, I was impressed by how well it ran. Right up until it didn't. Take a look at the minimum frame rate, 34 frames per second. It is not a smooth experience. It's great until it isn't. How about the i7 and AMD's Ryzen 7? The average frame rate is almost identical, 102 versus 99 frames per second. That is effectively the same speed. Now, some people would say, hey, look, the i7's faster. You'll never notice the difference. That's minor. Look at the minimums. Again, 69 to 71. That's effectively the same speed. I could rerun this test 10 times, and those numbers would swap just based upon where the camera was pointed or who was being shot at at that particular moment in time. Now, maximum frame rates are excellent excellent on all three CPUs, but that doesn't really matter so much. It's really the minimum and the average that counts. Battlefield 1 is completely and totally playable on both of the modern CPUs, allowing to make a very clear point. If you have a 1440p 60Hz monitor and turn VSync on with a GTX 1080 at ultra detail, both the i7 and AMD's Ryzen will run rock solid steady 60 frames per second without any issues or hiccups in campaign mode. It just doesn't make any difference. Now, multiplayer might be different. That'll be coming up in a separate video. How about Assassin's Creed Syndicate? Now, this was a very interesting result. The FX8300 did very, very well. If you want to play this very graphics card bound game and you have an older FX series processor, it actually plays very, very well. I did not have any problems playing it. 62 frames per second average, 44 minimum, very, very playable. The i7 had a better average frame rate, but a worse minimum frame rate. The AMD R7 was right in the middle. It had a better minimum than the i7 and exactly the same average as the older FX based chip. Assassin's Creed Syndicate is completely graphics card bound. Now, certainly, I could turn the graphics down to 1080p, set it to medium detail, and you would see larger gaps here. But again, you don't buy $1,000 worth of graphics card and CPU to play at 1080p at medium detail, or you shouldn't. So, in this game, so long as you have enough graphics card, just about any quad-core or greater CPU from the past five years will run it just fine. Speaking of graphics card limited games, how about Mankind Divided? Look at these results. This exemplifies what I've seen in game after game after game. If you set them to the detail and quality settings that you'll really play on when you have $600 graphics cards and $350 processors, it doesn't make as much of a difference as you'd think. In fact, the FX8300 continues to be a better processor than I was honestly expecting. I've never actually put this good of a graphics card in a chip like that, and it's, uh, take a look, 44 frames per second minimum, 58 average, 73 max. Now, the other processors have slightly better minimums, and in the actual gameplay, you're likely to get better overall results. However, it is an impressive result, considering how old and relatively underpowered that FX chip really is. Good graphics card, decent CPU, you'll be just fine in Mankind Divided. Like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you loved it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with the big huge button directly below. Post your comments below the video and as always check out the video description for all the details 
all the links to everything mentioned, my link to the launch video for the AMD Ryzen CPU, links to Amazon and Newegg for all the processors mentioned here in this video. And finally, let me know what you think of this new review format. This is the first time that I have done one of these where I've put multiple games in and multiple CPUs in. It's something new that I'm trying to condense my videos down. Now, this is a 30-minute long video, but it is three games and three CPUs, so it's three, it's nine different tests in total. I appreciate you watching. Thank you so much, and I will see you in the next video.